Yeah, first class today, uh-huh. Not first class, of course. I see, where are you from? I'm from York, Pennsylvania, how about you? Oh, I'm, I'm from the Philippines. Okay, which one, where? Or where, mm -hmm. where in the Philippines? Um, near Manila in Luzon, two hours from Manila. Um, it's called Pampanga. You can the stream now. Okay. You can continue with the, the guide afterwards. Um, okay, Deb, I'm going to make you host. So you can continue adding people now, okay? All right, thank you. You're welcome. And, and kind of make me the co-host. Um, yeah, I'm trying, but I just now got my host back here. So give me a second. Right. Okay. There. All right. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Usually, how many hour, How many classes do you have? Uh, it just. Hold on one second. I need to get things squared away here first. Okay, sure, no problem. Well, you know, I'm I, I will be working toward fifteen to eighteen, so maybe seven to ten in a week. But right now, it's been we're in, in transition, adding some new classes, so that kind of thing. Oh, okay, I see. Okay, so people are coming in right now, so I'll just be in the background. Okay. Sure. Thanks. I'll introduce Thanks. you. Hi, Linda. Welcome back. Hi, Natalie. Hello, thank you. <laughs> Hello, Laura. Hello. Welcome to class. We have a few people here today, so we'll wait for them to join us. Natalie, nice to see you again. Hi, Dale. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Fine, thanks. Are you going to join by camera today, Dale? Uh. <laughs> okay. Can I talk you into it? It's okay if you don't want to be. Hi, Katie. You're doing it, Laura. Thanks for joining by camera. All right. there's, there's Elise. Hello, Elise. Welcome back. Oh, she's just getting here. I like this. Laura, you brought lunch. I did. Right. Right. <laughs> That's exactly what you could be doing here. No better class to be eating in than a cooking class, right? <laughs> or a food class. Okay. So... Is everybody give, getting a chance to try some new classes on uh, Get Set Up? Have you tried some things out of your norm? Just experimented with things like Qigong or learning how to use Google Photos. We have so many interesting classes and, and I just wondered if you've uh, taken the step to experiment with some things that are new to you. Anybody? What are you enjoying? Mostly the technology stuff about phones and computers. Yep. Well, then I feel good that you're here. <clears throat> heart healthy cooking. That's that's yes, this is different. Yes. Yes. This is different. Well, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen a while so we can get started. I think people may drift in, and that's okay. All right, so do you all see my slide screen now that says heart healthy cooking? All right, we're on board. Great, well, welcome to all of you and we're glad that you're here today. Is there, is, who is besides Laura? Laura, this is your first time with me in a class? Okay, well, welcome and sorry, I ask questions when people have their mouths full. Why do I have a knack for doing that? So yes and no is good. And I know Natalie's been with me before, and so has Elise. Who else is new with me today? Linda's been with me before. Anybody else brand new to, 
to my classes today. Okay. All right. Well, welcome back then, all of you. And welcome to you, Linda. Or Laura, excuse me. My name is Deb Livingston, and I'll be your guide for today. I live in York, Pennsylvania, where it's a beautiful sunny spring day. I hope you're enjoying similar, similar spring weather. It surely does give me a lot more energy. My background is in psychology and adult and organizational development. So I spent a lot of my career, most of my career, training and coaching leaders and managing teams and standing up in front of groups of people to teach them things. And it's really nice to be in this environment now where people actually come in to show, show up because they wanna be here and they wanna learn the things that I have to teach. And I'm excited about the things that I teach because I do like food. I'm an organic grower or organic gardener. And I really do have a bit of a passion for eating whole foods and healthy foods. So that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. You've all been to some Get Set Up classes. Is there anybody who is absolutely brand new to Get Set Up today? Okay, so you know that we do learn best from each other. I just bring part of the puzzle to the table here and you all bring a lot more and we learn from each other. I'm constantly bringing things that people have shared with me to new classes and that's a nice thing to do and spread knowledge. So ideally we can see you, your camera's on and you're participating with your microphone or in the chat box. And I want to introduce you to Phil today. He's up there in the little get set up corner. He's our tech person and he's going to keep an eye on the chat for me. And also if you have any questions or problems with your technology, he's here to help with that. So shout out to Phil. And also a shout out to the folks who are on live stream because now we have people who can watch us on on Get Set Up TV. And if you are joining us by live stream, we're happy to have you here and even happier if you register and, and join us in a class where we can see your face and have you participate with us. And the last thing that I will say about this uh, class and any others that I would teach is that Get Set Up isn't paid to promote any products or any services or websites that we might show you. So I just wanted you to know that those things are being shared just because I think they may be of interest to you. So I have a really ambitious agenda today for this class, uh, but I really wanna go over the things that are most important to you. This is intended to be not just really a recipe class, it's intended to be an overarching look at foods and eating healthy for your heart. So we are going to start with what are the food related factors that are implicated in heart disease to begin with. And then we'll talk about some tips for a heart healthy diet. And you probably have some of those that you have learned through the years from your doctors or from other people. And I hope you contribute those as well. And then I want to share some of the eight power foods. Well, I'll share the eight power foods that really, when you incorporate them into your diet, uh, you will take great strides in creating for yourself a heart healthy diet. And then lastly, I do have some meal and recipe ideas. And sometimes we don't always get through all of those recipes. So you can let me know which is most important to you. And if you really want those to get to those recipes, let me know. But I want to assure you that at the end of the class, you're going to get links in the email that I send to you that will give you everything we talk about, links to all the websites and to all the recipes. So even if we don't get to go over all those in detail, you're going to get those. So if you've taken my classes before, you probably have received emails like that. Linda, you were in a cooking class with me recently. Did you get the email and the links? Yes, yep. I did. Thank you. Yes. Great. So that worked out very well. Yes. All right. So so I guess I would like to stop right now before we get into this question. And I just in, invite you to unmute yourself and let me know what, what was the primary reason you came today? Is it just general interest? Is there something particular that you were looking for? This is Rose and I want to live to be at least 100. Okay, Rose, that's a great goal. All right. At least at least 100. Yes. Wow. Okay. Wow. 
It's a good thing we came today then. Let's get I, That's you. right. I want to give Methuselah a run for his money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's a good goal. <laughs> Who else? I wanted recipes. You want some recipes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I have some recipe ideas. I'll make sure we get to those. Uh, this is a new, this is Laura, just a new topic for me and I'm interested. Okay. So are you okay with learning some of that background information that I talked about? Is that anything? Okay? Yes. Fine. Yep. All right. Anybody else? Um, I agree. Uh, recipes and, um, I just want to live healthier. Um, my dad, I believe, died of a heart attack at 75. Um, so I, I just don't want to make that same mistake. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, forewarned is forearmed. So now we get a chance to make changes because we are not necessarily products of our genes. We can change things. So yeah. So what are, when you think about it, the food-related things that you think of that lead to heart disease? What comes to mind? Fatty foods. Fatty foods. Okay. So especially saturated fat. Okay. What yeah. else? Salt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Too much sodium in our diet makes for our hardening of the arteries is what they called it, right? Rigidity in our arteries. Alcohol. Oh yeah, alcohol. Oh, I do enjoy a glass of wine, but yep, too much of that is a not a good thing, right? Right. Okay. Um, I guess like uh, what kind of oils to use for different foods and like how much, because I know they can cause a, your a clogged artery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And conversely, they can they can actually help your arteries if right. you find. So that's a really great point, Natalie. Thanks for bringing that one up. Yep. So here are some of the things that I think about that are food related things. One is if we overindulge and overindulge in the wrong kinds of things, we can reach that point where we are um, gaining a little more weight than we should. And when we do that, we tax our hearts. It's just a physical burden on our heart to have too much excess weight. So is uh, who's familiar with the term BMI and measures it? Just give me a hand wave. Okay. So do you know what your BMI is? Nope. <laughs> we may know the term. Yeah, sometimes we know the term. Sometimes we don't know our measure. No. So just for you to know that the, that the uh, normal BMI falls with, between the range of um, 18.5 to 25. And I'm going to be sending you a uh, little calculator because the formula for this is the, your, the pounds that you weigh divided by your inches squared. So nobody wants to do that math, but I'll send you a little calculator and you get to put your, your pounds in and your inches in and it'll calculate it for you. Just know that if, you are cons if you're 25 to 30, it, if we have that kind of a BMI, we're considered overweight and over 30 is uh, corresponds to the obese range. So that's one thing we want to really get a handle on, keeping our weight down. And then you named it, too much sodium can cause high blood pressure. Not everybody reacts to sodium with the same vigor <laughs> or the same sensitivity, but in overall, um, so we don't have to necessarily totally eliminate salt, but we should be getting less than 2,300 milligrams per day. That's less than a teaspoon or a teaspoon or less. Uh, at one average, we get about 34, the average person gets about 3,400 milligrams. So we can go a long way by eliminating processed foods because they are loaded with sodium. If you start to pay attention to the nutrition labels on the back of cans and so on, you will see that it is uh, where you're going to get a large amount of your sodium. And so high blood pressure happens when we retain water and that's what sodium makes us do. It makes us retain water and exerts pressure on those blood vessels. So that's the problem. And then we have diets that are high in sugar. Did, did somebody mention sugar? No, we don't think we mentioned sugar. We mentioned fat. But sugar actually can make us fat because high amounts of sugar cause an insulin response. We can, we can uh, move toward type 2 diabetes and high triglycerides, which are another form of fat 
which actually can increase our cholesterol. So it's a really crazy kind of combination of things. And diet, diets high in sugar are just not good for a whole lot of anything. Inflammation is a key factor in so many chronic diseases and sugar really fuels infl inflammation. So that's another reason to reduce it. And we should have less than, uh, for women, six teaspoons of added sugar per day. For men, less than nine teaspoons of added sugar per day. Added sugar being the sugar that is not found inherent in the foods that you eat. So again, if you're buying processed foods, they will perhaps have added sugars. If you're eating fruits, you want to eat wise fruits too because some are much higher in sugar. Not that you can't have them, but you need to monitor that a little bit. Before then, you move on, I'm sorry, uh, what is inflammation? Inflammation is just irritation through, it can happen in a variety of places with it. It, it literally means inflammation of or, or um, irritation of, could be irritation of your, of your um, gastrointestinal system. It could be an irritation within your arteries. When your arteries get inflamed, lots of times what will happen with inflammation in those is that cholesterol is actually, <laughs> cholesterol is actually a healing thing. It's not a bad thing. Our body produces it to, to take care of us. And cholesterol will go to your arteries to patch over the inflamed spots to try to heal it. But what happens then is it narrows the artery. And this is where we can sometimes have clots that lead to heart attacks or closures of those arteries. So dealing with reducing inflammation deals with, with uh, the, co the core reason, the, the fundamental reason why we have some of these other issues. Does that make sense? Yes. So inflammation can happen anywhere in your body. Thank you for stopping me. And I'm just going to pause right now because I realize I'm speaking quickly and I want to make sure that if you have other questions, you can ask them now before I move on. Other questions or comments about what I've just said so far? Okay. So diets high in saturated fat. Rose, you were talking about fat and so were you, Natalie. So uh, diets high in saturated fat can help, can lead to higher le levels of cholesterol, especially LDL cholesterol, which is considered the bad cholesterol. And HDL is considered a better cholesterol, a good cholesterol. And there's a lot of science behind all that we won't get into. But, you know, we need to be having between 20 and 35% of our diet in fat. So all those things you might have heard about that led you to believe that we should be eliminating fats from our diet just isn't true. We do need, however, to have the right type of fat. And so less than 23 grams of saturated fat in your diet per day is the rule of thumb. And where do we get our saturated fats from? Do you know? Fried food. What kind of fried food? Yeah, but how, what fried in what or fried how? Uh, oh, I see, in oil. <laughs> oil because the higher the content of the temperature uh, brings out the, the intensity of it. Okay, so I see what you're talking about. So some of the oils, it, you're, you might be talking about the burn point or the, yeah, the, imp, the burn point of certain fats can lead to some carcinogens if you heat them to too high of a temperature. So that's a slightly different, different uh, factor that you're talking about, but saturated fat typically comes from animal products. So we get our saturated fats from meats. And if we're eating, um, conventionally raised beef, we may get more saturated fat than if we eat grass-fed beef, which is higher in omega-6 and especially omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 and omega-6 are good ones for us, but especially omega-3 because it's a little harder to get. We get omega-6s all the time in chicken when we eat it and in a lot of other foods, but omega-3s are found in in oils like olive oil. And I especially like avocado oil for cooking because it has a lighter taste, but it has a high nutrient value. I like chosen brand. I'm telling you this because 
It's one of two, and I can't remember the name of the other one, that was identified in a, stu in a study done by the University of California at Davis that studied the, um, the, um, whether, the, whether the oils in the bottle were actually what they said they were. And so those, that brand was actually a good quality avocado oil and it was not rancid. Rose, do you have a question? Yes. Um, what do you um, think of or recommend in regards to the omega-3 supplements? I don't have a particular brand recommendation. I think they are fine supplements to take, to take based on what you can find, uh, what you, the conversation you have with your doctor in, in combination with anything else that you might be doing. So I think that that one size doesn't fit all and what one person needs more or less of, you know, than another. So right. you really need to coordinate that a little bit and, and in line with the other things that you're, that you're taking. But uh, you can also get a lot of these omega-3s through foods. So the supplements are fine. Yeah, go ahead, Laura. What was the name of the particular avocado oil you like? Chosen. Chosen, thank you. You're welcome. So let's move on because I get really excited about these topics and I'm <laughs> off of slide number one or two here. So eight tips to get you there. Control your portion size. And one of the best ways, of, there are two good ways of doing this in my opinion. One is to go online and actually get a visual, something like this, that lets you get a feel for how big a particular portion size, how, how big it is, how, how it looks. So here you can see that a that a serving of tables of uh, peanut butter, for example, is two tablespoons, and it's about the size of a golf ball. So you don't have to measure out by the by the tablespoonful. The other way of doing this um, is to get yourself a small kitchen scale. I got one for really inexpensive a couple of years ago. It was the best investment I ever made because I started to measure things, and once I measured them a few times. I had no problem just having a real sense of what a serving was. I can do a pound of hamburger now in patties and I put them in balls and put them in my measuring and, and I get them at 0.25 every time. And it's just amazing and I've gotten pretty good at that. So control your portion size, know what you're eating. Here's cheese, I like this one. It's a serving of cheese is about one and a half ounces, I think it is. It's like two dominoes, the size of two dominoes. There's your smiling face, Rose. <laughs> and eat more vegetables and fruits. We talked about that a little bit. Um, the color is important because different fruits and vegetables with their color reflect the vitamins that are inherent in them. Beta carotene is, is the oranges in carrots. They're good for our eyes, that's why. And lycopene, red in tomatoes. So colorful plates are important and selecting whole grains. You know, there's two things in our diet that we eat regularly that provide us with absolutely no nutrition, but make us fat. <laughs> and that's, and that's sh table sugar, that's sugar. And that is white flour, the kind that you get in white bread because they have absolutely zero nutrition. The white flour is made from what is called the ectosperm of the grain, and it has nothing in it. And, and what has the food value in it is the bran and the germ, and that gets discarded. But when you buy whole grain bread, those things are included in the grain. I know it's an acquired taste. It's not as soft and fluffy, but it's definitely worth making the transition. So stay away from things that you read that the, where the first ingredient says um, unbleached refined flour or bleached refined flour or something like that, and go to whole grain. And in, if you're baking, at least make half and half. You can always substitute partial. And then un limit those unhealthy fats, which we talked about. So trans fats, look at the label of any baked goods that you might be buying that are already made or any labels of processed foods and make sure there's zero trans fats. They're not good no matter what. They've done a good job of getting rid of them but uh, there may still be some around. 
I don't buy that kind of thing very often. So I haven't really been looking. I don't really check it out, but you might, especially those kind of junky snack things that you buy really inexpensively. They might use those as a way to preserve. So also we talked about, uh, well, eating lean protein. So st sticking with what, are, what would you consider as lean protein? Fish. Mm -hmm. Fish. Fish is definitely a lean protein. The things that are in this photo. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. No rose. Yeah, a nutshell. <laughs> in a nutshell. And literally a nutshell right here. Yep. Okay. <laughs> and, and beans and beans and, and shellfish and chicken and even and even some steaks and things. So just stick with lean and get rid of the skin on the chicken. That's good. The salt we already talked about, the variety we talked about, and also allow yourself some treats. This isn't, you know, a heart healthy diet doesn't have to be miserable. It can be really, really good. And there's no reason that you should have to eliminate chocolate from your life if you love chocolate or even ice cream. You just have to manage portions and look for ways to reduce some of those bad things that we talked about. So out of all of these, do you have an Achilles heel, something that you really feel like you can't get rid of? Or um, what, what is that? Bluebell vanilla ice cream. Bluebell. Mm. Okay. Does, doesn't Bluebell, oh no, I'm thinking of Blue Bunny. Blue Bunny no. has uh, sugar alcohol. No. Okay. Blue, Blue Bell tastes like you churned it. Remember back when we were kids? How yeah. we all had to take turns churning the ice cream? Yes, it does. Rock salt. Mm. Okay, yes. That uh, ice cream is ruthless. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who else has a who else has a habit that is hard to quit that you need a substitute for? Anything? You guys are good. No bad habits. <laughs> Potato chips. Potato chips. Oh, see now. Oh, you were guilty. <laughs> Here we go. No, true confession. <laughs> Love the potato chips. Can't even have them in the house because if they're here, they're gone in an instant. My mom always had a, a big box. We used to get big boxes of them. And then she had, after we moved out, there was always a bag that was stored in the oven. And, you know, when I went up there to visit her, the first place I went was for the oven <laughs> potato chips. So. I get that one. So Laura, you know about Charlie's chips, right? Yes. And the can. Oh my God, I have a can now. Oh my God, I feel so bad. <laughs> Damn, but what would you use for a substitute for sugar? Um, oh, that's a great question. You know, and if you take... You know, sign up for my healthy desserts class too, because we get into that in great detail. We okay. talk about ways to um, substitute, but you can look at things like sugar alcohols and mm. substitute sugar alcohols, monk fruit, and um, let's see what's, and stevia are three things that I can think of that would be good substitutes that you could try. So they don't have any chemicals in them? As far as substitutes, that's a problem. Yeah, they they are they are processed. I can't speak to the processed part because I'm not really fond of things that are processed like they are. Stevie right. is normally green and it's processed to be powdery and white. It's not my favorite thing, but when I'm looking at the, weighing the pros and the cons of having sugar versus having something that doesn't act on me, I figure it's the lesser of the two evils. Okay. But I do stay away from that blue packet NutraSweet. Oh, I, yeah. Yeah. I just have a lot of, you've heard that, that it's got a lot of bad things associated with it. it it's a little bit of a neurotoxin, I think. And, uh, you know, Splenda is okay. I eat, drink, use that occasionally if, I, if there's no other thing available at the coffee shop and I want a little sweet something. So, do you have a suggestion when you are craving for a sweet, what you could use for a substitute? I mean, what fruit, what type of fruit would you mm. use? Mm, that's a great segue into what we're going to talk about. Oh, okay. No, no, this is a perfect question. So, and I'll just answer it and then we'll see where it shows up in the presentation. Uh, I would say the, 
the fruits that you want to think about starting with would be berries. They are superfoods and they're going to show up here on my power food list. Berries of all sorts, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, strawberries. They are low in sugar relative to all the fruits. They are high in fiber. They are so colorful. So what do you think is that tells us it's the high right. antioxidants and all the other things. So that's what you, you use. And you know what I do with some, well, I'll get into that later. So okay. you have your hand up. <laughs> okay, <Yes. laughs> thank you. I wanted to ask you about the sugars. Um, lately, I've been experiencing with um, brown, uh, the um, raw sugar. So what do you think about the raw sugar as opposed to the white sugar? Because I noticed that when I'm using the raw the raw sugars, it seems like I have to use more of it yeah. to get satisfaction. Well, they're larger crystals. I think they're made a different way, but they're just the same sugar. That you know, so that's sugar is sugar is just wrong period. <laughs> that raw sugar is a real marketing ploy. I think. Uh, thank you, <laughs> thank you, because I fell for the okie doke with getting the raw sugar because I thought it would be a healthier version. Oh, of of course, they do that to us all the time. It's just like having the word natural on your food packages. That means nothing. Okay, right. thank you. Okay, yeah. thank you. And Mac, one more. Uh, Mac, you're you're here. I don't know your name. You have you're up on your list. Mary Ann. Mary Ann. So Mary Ann, another fruit that I would add in there that I think is something that's really healthy for a lot of reasons is um, apples. Oh yeah. And apples with a little nut butter on. Remember when we were kids? At least I got these in school. Half of an apple with peanut butter on it. Peanut butter, right? Really healthy snack, and they knew that a long time ago. So what are some of the other power foods that you learned that you might want to include in a healthy, heart healthy diet? What have you heard picked up along the way? Go ahead, Natalie. Avocados. Avocados, yep, they're great. They're very high. Okay, they're very high in the omega-3 fatty acids. They are also really relatively high in fiber. There's five grams of fiber in an avocado, a half of an avocado. And just to give you a relative feel for that, uh, we should be getting about 25 grams of fiber in, uh, in our diet each day. A piece of whole grain bread gets us between three and five grams. So you really have to be intentional about getting fiber. But vegetables have fiber, but relatively small amounts of it compared to whole grains and these avocados and the fruits we talked about. Blackberries actually have eight grams of fiber per cup. They come in the highest. Hmm. What other foods? All right, I guess I'm going to tell you then. I know you know some of these things. Fish. So we have fish that are fatty fishes. They're the ones. It's not the mild fishes. It's the salmons and the tunas and the trout, the ones that really taste like fish, right? And we got, we've got to be a little careful eating some of these older fish, bigger fish like the tuna, because they've been in the ocean for a while. They consume things that include toxic, toxins and mercury. And mercury does not lead, leave our body ever. It just builds up. So we should eat mercury or tuna, tuna uh, sparingly. We can eat it, but eat it sparingly. And instead, if we can manage to really acquire a taste for things like anchovies and sardines and herring and mackerel, that would be really good. They're, they're smaller fish, they don't stay in that long. They're feeder fish kind of, they get consumed or they get caught. And so they're good additions. It's good to know. Whoops, what happened? There we go. And there's our berries. So we've already talked about that. And then we have this whole other area of, of uh, nuts and seeds. So these seeds carry with it, them a lot of B vitamins, a lot of fiber, and a lot of the, uh, the proteins, a lot of uh, omega-3 fatty acids. You might see uh, flax seeds, you grind them up, you can put them in smoothies, you can put them on your cereal and so on. The chia seeds are uh, little seeds that you need to hydrate first. They, can, they absorb water, they remind me of tapioca. And so they are good to consume that way. Um, nuts are of a similar composition 
in uh, nutritionally. And just, un just know though that they're very uh, fatty, like a quarter cup of nuts has about 200 calories. And I will say this because I have this personal experience. If I overeat on the nuts and seeds, if you have any kind of gastro diverticulitis or anything that tends this can be aggravating to it. So you've got to just take it slowly, try it. You should never have more than a tablespoon of those a day. Um, again, hydrated. They do have the side benefit of keeping us hydrated better. So consuming them in a glass of water, you know, if you just had a glass of water and it sat all day and you sipped on it, keeps the hydration in your body. So that's kind of good. And then we've got this whole area of eating lots of beans and legumes if you can, if you also can tolerate those. And there are different ways of preparing that. I'm doing a class tonight on bean soups and chowders. So eating beans in soup is one really great way to get a nourishing meal and get a good source of protein and fiber with or without meat. And then we've got oats, oatmeal. You know, how many of you eat oatmeal for breakfast? Yeah. So what are your favorite? What, tell me about your oatmeal breakfast. What do you put on your oatmeal? Um, raisins, cinnamon, nuts. Honey, honey. <coughs> raisins, cinnamon, nuts, honey. Sounds delicious. Cinnamon is a great thing to add because it does kind of keep your, it helps to regulate your blood sugar. So but if you didn't know that, Cinnamon is a great thing to be adding. You can bake your apples with a little bit of cinnamon on. Anytime you can work cinnamon in is good. And you can really change up your oatmeal so that you can basically have a different oatmeal dish every day. Did you know that you can also eat your oatmeal savory? So you can eat it with butter and, and salt and pepper on it occasionally too. Yeah. So that's just something if you get tired of eating it the same way. And then we talked about all those colorful fruits and vegetables. So more, more, more vegetables and maybe a little less meat, but more vegetables. So these are some of the suggestions that I have for recipes and breakfast. And I'll send you some of these, some of these recipes, well, all of these recipes. Uh, the first thing is that I think eggs are a complete protein. They're a really healthy thing to eat. But when we eat just egg, eggs and bacon, which I love, but uh, I try to expand the nutritional value of my breakfast by loading my eggs up with lots of vegetables. And that can be done in a variety of ways. Sometimes what I do is just saute whatever vegetables I might have cut up in my refrigerator. The other day it was, it was onions and mushrooms and red pepper. And then when all that was sauteed, I put spinach in there and I just let that wilt a little bit and then I poured scrambled egg over it. I drizzled a little cheese because I do love cheese. And I threw that in the oven at 350. It was in a stainless steel pan. Put it in the oven at 350. It was done in less than 10 minutes. It was a wonderful omelet that I didn't have. It was a frittata that I didn't have to flip. And it was delicious. And I could put anything in there. And what I'm going to send you is basically the same kind of idea. But this is a baked omelet muffin that you can make which allows you to make them ahead. You can, you can create some uh, little egg muffins with vegetables and you can have them for the whole week. You have single serving sizes. So make them one time and have them for the week. I've even frozen these and they do really nicely being warmed up afterwards. So I know sometimes you're trying to get ahead of the game that way and that's a way to do it. So I talked to you about eating whole grain and I talked to you about eating avocado when well, Natalie brought up avocado. It doesn't show up as a power food on there as a group group because it's just a food, but it certainly is a power food. So, so this whole grain bread has lots of fiber. The avocado has a lot of omega-3 and fiber and then these sardines. Now, I don't know, but I never before this class ate sardines on avocado toast for breakfast, but I did it because I wanted to see how it would go and whether I could recommend it. And I must say that I can, I can recommend it. Uh, I got those sar sardines in olive oil and I did sprinkle some little bit of red pepper over the pepper flakes and ate them just as it appears on this picture. 
Now I'm going to send you a recipe here that, that is a way to marinate those sardines a little bit. So if you don't like such a pure fish taste, you might give them a try and just see whether that works for you. And of course you don't have to eat them for breakfast. You could try it maybe at another time if fish sounds like not a good idea at 8 a.m. So I get that. So anybody think they could just possibly give it a try? Yeah, you would try it, Natalie. Come back and let me know because I did have somebody who was in this class who did come back and say that they had it and they said, you know, it was pretty good. So I was, you know, I felt the same way. So here's the oatmeal that we talked about. I like to so soak my grains, including my oatmeal the night before. And I do that in a little bit of something like, uh, it could be buttermilk, it could be a tablespoon of um, yogurt or sour cream, just something that has a little bit of acid in it because what that does is it soaks away what's called phyte, the phytates or the phytic acid that covers a lot of grains and nuts. And that's a whole other story, but those are known as basically anti-nutrients. It's the coating that's on these things that if we don't get it off or break it down, uh, kind of prevents us from absorbing the good things that are in these grains. So who knew, right? So you want to try to maximize. And so I soak my oatmeal. It makes it uh, takes less time to cook it in the morning, especially steel cut oats if you want them. And you can use all kinds of things in there. And I would say diversify, you know, use strawberries one day, blueberries another, use uh, use, I recommend the whole fruits, fresh fruits, raisins are fine, but remember they're like little sugar pills. They are really highly, highly concentrated with sugar. So fresh fruits are good. And then you can use regular milk or you can use a milk sub, a different kind of milk. I use oat milk here. Um, I put some flax in, a little bit of cinnamon, some pecans. You can do a little maple syrup drizzle. I have this new product that I use and it's a collagen supplement and it, it is sweetened by stevia and flavored. So this one happens to be a cinnamon toast flavor and I sprinkle some of it over my oatmeal and it makes my oatmeal sweet without sugar. So those are some creative things that you can do to change up your oatmeal and make it more uh, diverse if you like. And I will send you some information about how to soak your oatmeal. Yeah, Natalie. Can you repeat what you just said that you used for sugar? This or did is, you say not sugar? Uh, no, this is not sugar. This is something called um, Keto Collagen. K-E-T-O is the brand. Keto Collagen. And they have collagen powders that come in lots of different flavors. This one happens to be cinnamon toast. It doesn't have any sugar in. It's sweetened with, it's sweetened with stevia. And it does give you a collagen, you know, a collagen boost. And we know that collagen helps us to hopefully build more um, collagen in our bodies. It, it does get broken down into amino, amino acids and we hope rebuilds into collagen, but it's a healthy supplement. So that's what I use. And it does come in chocolate too. It makes great cocoa. So another way to get a good boost of something healthy. So these are some lunchtime boosts that can be really tasty mm. for you. Uh, I love this kale salad, Deb's kale salad. That's not mine. That's another Deb. And who makes kale salad now? Anybody eat kale salad? No. Somebody say they did? Anybody? Yep, Laura, you do? So tell me about what the secret is to making a good kale salad. What have you learned about making good kale salad? Not a whole lot, because <laughs> it just is still so grainy. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I have to ask you, Laura, do you do this with your kale? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's important, cutting it into very bite-sized pieces and then putting a little salt on it and massaging it all okay. the way until it starts. You could start with a whole bowl of kale and by the time you're done, when it's really getting good, it should be half of what it was. And it gets really dark green. See how different it looks here? That's the secret. And now what we're going to do is put on a dressing that's made out of, it's a really nice dressing. Let me get to the recipe. So the salad ingredients are, are the pecans and the kale and some radishes, some dried cranberries again, or dried cherries. They are those little sweetie things. I go for the dried cherries. I think they pop, 
pack a better nutritional punch, but they're both good. And a Granny Smith apple and a little bit of goat cheese. You know, the Chevra logs is really good crumbled on this. And your dressing is this really nice, you know, lightly sweet kind of tangy uh, vinaigrette that's made with olive oil, apple cider vinegar, Dijon mustard, a little bit of maple syrup or honey, and a little salt and pepper. So you wanna to toast your pecans too. I'm just looking at this down here, toast your pecans and then just toss all of that. It's delicious salad, very, um, I don't know, it's just very, uh, especially with the goat cheese on it, filling as a lunch by itself. <laughs> Sorry, oh, there we go. And then how many of you have eaten a veggie and hummus sandwich? Who eats hummus? Anybody eat hummus? Yeah, I yeah. like hummus. Yeah, what kind of hummus, what flavor of hummus do you like? I like it with the pine nuts. Yeah. Uh, generally, that's what I'll eat. Okay. I have one now that's got roasted garlic in it. I love it. So hummus, what is hummus? It is your chickpeas ground up. And you're ground up with tahini, which is sesame right. paste. So very nutritious, high in fiber, high in vitamin B. It's a spread that you can make yourself or buy at the store. And, and you just consider putting it on whole grain bread. You can slather it on nice and thick. And then you just layer in there the ingredients that you enjoy. So one of the things I put on there is uh, some smashed avocado. And I would put whatever vegetables I might have in season or that are in my refrigerator. So it, the sky's the limit on that. You pick whatever vegetables you like, shredded carrots, cucumbers, tomatoes. I even put a slice of cheese in sometimes if I want the cheese. So that's another really wholesome uh, sandwich that you can have. And you can have that with or without a side of this white bean sage and sausage soup which really stands on its own as a meal as well. And that just simply has um, a very easy set of ingredients. You're using uh, some onion and fennel, a little red pepper. So uh, let me go down here to the ingredients or to the instructions. You're going to just cook all of these things together, saute all of these things together, add your add your garlic, and then add your sage and tomato paste, then add your white wine and stock, and you just cook it. It's super easy to make. And uh, the flavor of this hot Italian sausage really makes this a good and hearty soup. If you don't like sausage, you could uh, substitute some flavoring, some other kind of flavorings or herbs that you enjoy to kind of punch it up a notch. But I do if you're a meat eater. I, I tend to do a lot of vegetarian recipes, but every now and then I really do like to throw in these, these sausage recipes because you can get a lot of flavor out of even half the amount of sausage if you like. And you can use chicken sausage or whatever you, you prefer. Anything look appealing like you might want to have it for lunch? That veggie hummus sandwich and the soup looks good. I don't know about the kale. That's sold on kale yet. You know what? When I was on vacation, I made it for myself because my husband kind of turns his nose up at kale. So I made it for myself and there was some leftover in the refrigerator and he just kind of wandered upon it. <laughs> and, and he ate it. He ate the rest of it and there wasn't very much there. And he said, well, this is really good. Is there... <laughs> Is there any more? I said, well, you said you don't like kale. <laughs> okay. Hi, Phil, you have your hand up? Um, yeah, I have a question here from Katie. Yeah. Um, okay. The question is, is it possible to buy already prepared avocado instead of the whole thing? I can never get the right amount of ripeness and waste them when I try them. Oh, you can never get the right, What? say that again. What's the last part? Um, I can never get the right amount of ripeness and waste them when I try them. 
Yeah. Well, a couple tips on that. And I've been experimenting with this a little bit. I, if I get those avocados hard, first of all, I try, unless I really need them for a recipe that day, I don't buy a soft avocado. I get one that is uh, already hard and then I let it on the counter until it starts to get to what I would consider a softer, not dented in, but softer to the touch that I would cut it for the day. And then I put those in the refrigerator, but I have also frozen them whole. And when I get them out, they're beautiful. And I use them right away when they're thawed and, and they act like fresh. But having said that, you can buy um, guacamole that's already made and they preserve that a little bit with lime juice and probably a few other ingredients, but uh, there's not really a satisfactory way. You frozen avocado really isn't bad. But mm -hmm. can I just can I just say I always have fresh avocados in the house. But to answer that person's question, if they want to put a spread of some kind, I know Walmart, Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, they all now make these little packets, and it's like but one size servings, and they come in little cups. Now they're not a hundred percent pure. And you're right about that, Deb. I don't know what they add, it's acid or lemon or something, but it's a good substitute to keep in the house. And I generally have both. And you can also put the little cups in the freezer and take one out the day before. So if, you know, every once in a while you just feel like, oh, I want an avocado and you don't have one that's ready, that would serve the purpose. That's a great solution. I like that one, yeah. I will also cut an avocado and if I if I wrap it with with some kind of a wrap and kind of keep the oxygen out it stays well enough for a day or so and I can throw it into a smoothie. If I have a less than appealing looking avocado I don't throw it away unless it's really bad. I put it into a smoothie and and uh, it's perfectly fine for that. Okay. So, let's see what else we have. I have a few um what I consider delicious dinners that are easy to make and heart healthy. One is this baked pesto chicken. I like this a lot because you can, it's a freezer meal and it only has four ingredients. So you could make one of these up. If there are one or two of you, you could make one of these up with two chicken breasts. And if you had six breasts, you could make two more pans up, put them all together like this, put them in the freezer and then have them for a meal next week, next month. Um, you're looking at layering in the bottom of an eight inch square pan, a can of diced tomatoes that you have drained, and then your boneless chicken breast. This says put four in there. You know, I took a can of tomatoes and two breasts. That's all I wanted. Use your judgment on that. And then some pesto sauce. I wasn't crazy about how I measured it. I just slathered it on the breast and then topped it with some mozzarella cheese and really, you can just uh, put it in the freezer and freeze it for up to three months or and then just thaw it overnight. You can also, if you have a freezer uh, friend, freezer to oven safe glass pan or an aluminum pan, you can bake it from frozen. You just have to double the cooking time, basically. And it's uh, if you're cooking it from fresh, it's 20 to 25 minutes at 350. And you know that chicken should be cooked to 165 degrees. So that is a super easy and very tasty meal and very heart healthy, especially, oh, I keep going back to the wrong thing, especially if you're using um, reduced sodium tomatoes and you're watching your, your salt on what you season with. Um, you're good to go. You can even use fresh tomatoes. In the summertime, why not? If you have a garden and you have excess tomatoes, my goodness, just chop them up and put them in the bottom. And I love this. I love this because um, it allows you to eat some pasta. Now, I would, this one doesn't use whole grain pasta, or it appears not to, but I would. And I think this is so good because you get to have the flavors of intense cheese, if you like gorgonzola or blue cheese, without eating a, a really heavy cheese sauce. And this is why. What we're doing here is, um, this, this calls for uncooked fettuccine. Use whatever pasta you want. Whole grain would be preferred. Uh, three cups of sliced asparagus not margarine, but butter. I mean, I guess the margarines these days might be better, but honestly, 
for this little about bit of butter, I'd rather go with real butter, four cloves of garlic, a tablespoon of all purpose flour and some fat free milk and some fat free cream cheese. And then you see that this for the whole meal is only a half cup or two ounces of gorgonzola. So what are we doing? We're, we're going to cook the pasta and then at the very end, add the asparagus all in the same pot. So that's kind of nice just until it is tender. And then while the pasta is cooking, you melt the butter in the saucepan, add in the garlic and stir that for a little bit, then the flour, cook that, and then gradually add in the milk because you're making a cream sauce here. And then stir in the cream cheese and a little bit of salt and cook it until it gets smooth. So now you have a base of a very light cream sauce. Now I will tell you that that cream sauce or that cheese sauce is not really intense. It's if you left it alone like that, it might not suit your taste buds, but when you drain the pasta and the asparagus and you mix it with that sauce and sprinkle the gorgonzola on top of it, you'll be amazed at how intense that gets. And then if you put the walnuts on top then as well, you've got the added omega-3s and another kind of crunchy texture just a really good taste and it seems decadent. And then we whip in some um, spinach there at the end and just wilt it to get give you a veggie boost. I always add that spinach. Uh, I take their, their uh, amount as a suggestion and then I add more because I'm always looking to boost my veggies. And then lastly, here are these salmon foil packets and you can use your imagination on these. How many of you have cooked salmon in foil before? Anybody done that? Yeah, How? tell us about yours, Laura. Uh, very easy to do. Uh, and mainly, I really like baked salmon better than uh, grilled even or poached or whatever. So it's so easy just to bake it. Yeah. yeah. You close it up in the packet? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, me too. Grisha, you were also, were you going to say something? about salmon? No? Okay. Ooh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I do love salmon. I don't know if you called on me or you, someone else had a name similar, Deb. So no, I, I was calling on you because I thought you might have been wanting to say something about salmon because your oh. little box lit up. <laughs> really? Yeah, it might have just been that you were unmuted and you and there was a noise. So that's okay. Oh. No worries. But I would like to try it in the foil because I do also like to bake it and I do have it uh, try to always get wild salmon one you know at least once a week. Wild so that, salmon is a really good point too. It's much better for us because it's not dyed. This the farm raised stuff is dyed because it's right. actually like a really gray color, not very appetizing looking. So this is a much uh, the the wild salmon is much healthier. And you know you're using any vegetables you want and closing up that packet Honestly, this is something that I actually splurge also with butter because I love the taste of butter and salmon and then these fresh herbs, especially, especially dill. And in my opinion, under a lightly done salmon is more flavorful than salmon that you cook to a point of being more tough. So even if it's a little bit red in the center, it's uh, it's really delicious. I think that that's how, what uh, that's the way I like it too. You have to be careful. Is there a recipe for that? The temperature? Oh, oh, good. And how long to cook it, Deb? Yes. So they go for about fifteen to twenty minutes. Oh. But you know, I I get in there. I'm so worried about uh, ruining Me, a piece of salmon. Me too. It's Me too. So I'll check it after ten minutes. Yeah. or 12 and just know where it is. I'll put my fork in there to see where it right. is and, and then just watch it. Because they, they're all different thicknesses. It's hard to say. But you can throw them on the grill, similar time frame. And it does really do the same thing. If they're in foil, they're not getting any kind of smoky flavor. So those are some of the ideas that I have for recipes for heart healthy meals, including those power foods that we talked about. And that brings us to the conclusion of our class today. So we covered quite a bit, I think, and I'm happy that we did that within the time frame of the class. Sometimes I run over, so I'm really pleased that we got through all of this. And uh, I wanna invite you to some of my other classes. I do have one coming up. Actually, I would scratch this one off the list to say, come, come to the one that's now great spring meals. 
and I should have updated my slide, but I have great spring meals. We do have winter meals too, but it's spring now. So uh, I do have a lot of great meal classes and they're all being slightly different. Great, great meals, great spring, great winter, great, great fall. Um, I also do this healthy desserts class, healthy meals on a budget. So I would invite you to come to any of those classes and I hope you'll look for these recipes after the class in the email that I send you. Don't forget those links will be in there. Here's a link for feedback and to view the schedule. How are you all doing with scheduling your classes? Is that all working okay for you? Getting a little yes. easier the more you do it. Okay. It so it's, you're getting the hang of it. And sometimes it's a little harder when you're registering on mobile devices, I know. Exactly. So keep practicing. We're always here to help with that. Our tech support is always uh, willing to help you. I mentioned some of these fun classes. And when you do go into a class to book it, you always get an option to click and invite friends. And I want to just encourage you to do that for whatever class. Think about whether you have friends that live in another state or friends you haven't gotten to see because of the pandemic. It could be a really fun social event. And we want to spread the word about, about Get Set Up and to involve more people. If you know government groups or groups in your community like the YMCA that should get connected, this would be wonderful. The more we expand our, our group, the better. And I'm always looking for people who have a passion for food, any particular subject. So do any of you have, have this desire to want to join me in a class and maybe share your experiences in particular kinds of food lifestyles or types of recipes or ways of cooking? If you do, you can reach out to me. <laughs> Sometimes you're just happy to come to classes, right? Yep, and I'm happy to have you. But I also want to welcome you to share with me if you have some knowledge that you want to share with the group. So I'm going to stop sharing this right now so I can see you all. And it looks like, looks like Phil has left. Natalie, yeah. Um, did you say you had a dessert class on today? Not today, no. Oh, it's, okay. It's today. Um, Let's see the next time. Let me see if I can check that out for you real quickly. And then while you're checking, um, maybe you could have a class on um, safe protein drinks. Um, I started an exercise class and a lot of people are using them. And I'm like, mm, I don't know how safe they are. I don't know what what kind of, I'm not going to spend $25, $30 on a container and then not like it or, you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. Yeah. That's a tough, that's tough, isn't it? There Is are it? things that are, yeah, I mean, you just don't know what the ingredients can be. Um, you have to be skeptical of the ingredients because right. what are, what's the source of protein? Sometimes it's soy, and if it's soy isolate, soy is a GMO product typically, and it is also uh, been known to be a hormone disruptor. So we women have to be a little concerned about soy. So you have to look for the beep. Pea protein is probably the source of protein that is that may be the best. Pea protein. What it, say it again. Pea protein. P E A. That's P. Mm -hmm. P E A protein. Uh huh. Pea, like the pea. It is a vegetable pea. The pea. Okay. Uh, you look, do a little research on that and see what you come up with. Until we would have to do some such thing. So okay. Get a chance. Sure. So like. Um, Okay. Just I was thinking of um, just getting a bottle of something rather than, you know, I don't know how much bottles are, what, two oh. or three bucks maybe, and rather than the powder and mixing it. Yeah. I don't know. I think I would, I would imagine that would be more costly per unit, but I don't really know. I have not, I don't, I don't use them, so I'm not very familiar with them, but I've written this down as some as a topic to put on the list, and I'll be looking for people who might know more about that, who might teach a class in that, because right now I've just become the, uh, the, the, the person who looks over all food, nutrition, and cooking classes, so I'll be looking at ways to expand and topics to expand on. So I love to hear your ideas. Please give me any other ideas you might have in that. And when you go into feedback, you can put it in the comments. It gets added to our list. And then we review that and, and add it. And 
Have Where are you? Ever, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Go, Mac. Go, go. Okay. Have you ever thought of doing a class for diabetes cooking? Yep, that is on our list, actually. Okay, it's, it's great. Development for sure. Yep, thank yeah. you for confirming that. Laura? You'll repeat this class when? I forgot to invite a friend. Oh, this class? Yeah. This class will come up again on, I think on 412. Okay. And the... Um, Thank you. Oh, That's uh, the healthy desserts is coming up on four fifteen. Okay. Clock on Eastern. And Great. Eastern. Okay. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for coming, and I do see something else here in the chat. Just want to make sure. Okay, you're welcome, Mac. And uh, I will say goodbye and thank, thank you. Thank you for coming. Great thank you. Great participation. I really appreciated your input. Bye, Natalie.